Our study tonight begins in verse 11 of Genesis 27, and I'm going to finish the chapter and just ask you to bear with me. The one thing that you really need to try to do is let the Spirit of God teach you the lessons from this. I promise you nobody wants to have to deal with the kind of things that we're dealing with tonight. Father, as we begin our study tonight, we ask not only for your blessing, we ask for your power. We also, O oh God, ask that you wrap your arms around us and let us know that all of these things that we're going to read about tonight can be avoided for all of us. Lord, this is one of the most messed up families that you can ever imagine. And then you read through it and you think, well, it's worse than you thought it was initially. So help us tonight. Father, your spirit is always at work. I honestly don't know how you're going to use this Bible study. Certainly to win anybody, if anybody's here who's not a believer. But honestly, I don't know how you're going to use it in the rest of us either. So Jesus, we just surrender our hearts and our minds to you. Be glorified. We love you. We thank you. I so appreciate the beautiful time of worship. We're grateful for all you've done. You are, what did we sing, so, so good. Amen. If any of you are old enough to remember the TV shows through the late 70s into the 80s, um, Dallas and Dynasty, well, the Ewings and the Carringtons have nothing on Isaac and Rebecca and the kids. Now, I say Isaac, Rebecca, and the kids, they are. But one of the things that we need to know, we picture this, uh, you know, a, a husband, a wife, and two young, vigorous men. Um, remember the twins, Esau and Jacob, are now about 77 years old. And I point that out because they ought to know better. This is really and truly ugly because this is the most dysfunctional family. I am personally convinced that Joan Collins came and studied Rebecca's life to become so wicked. That's what this chapter is all about. If this were a television series, it would be called Reap What You Sow. And we're going to see that tonight. Verse 11, Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man and I'm a man with smooth skin. Now you remember it started last week. I spent the entire study on just the first 10 verses to lay a foundation, not so much for tonight's study, but for our study in the life of Jacob, which will begin next time. And the plot is simple. Rebekah wants Jacob to have the blessing. Isaac wants Esau to have the blessing. They both play favorites. They're both behind the scenes trying to manipulate things and trying to outsmart God. That is the real tragedy behind this whole thing. Remember, they know who gets the blessing from before the time the twins were born. Rebecca calls out to God, why is this going on in my stomach? Two nations are at war in your womb. And she knew, and he was, she was told by God that the older will be, or actually will serve the younger. So everything we talked about last week and everything we're going to talk about tonight didn't have to happen. And I want to point that out right at the beginning because every one of us can understand that if we will be obedient to God, all of the stuff that lies ahead in your future, the bad stuff, the ugly stuff, all of that that lies in your future doesn't have to be. If you'll just decide you're going to walk with God, you're going to trust him, you're going to believe him. Well, Jacob and Rebekah and Isaac and Esau, they simply wouldn't let it be that easy. And so we encounter this mess tonight. 
Jacob says, what if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. You might highlight that I would appear to be tricking him. This is a man who is more concerned about how things appear than he is the reality. The reality is that they are tricking him. This whole plot that Rebecca has come up with is a trick. And she's going to drag her son, the one she loves, Jacob, into this plot. And Jacob, you can see at the very beginning, is having second thoughts. Like, this isn't going to work. Who's going to confuse me and my brother Esau? Now, remember, Esau is really, really hairy. Esau is a man who, well, we're going to find out later that he sort of smells like the field. Jacob is a smooth-skinned man, sort of a studious type. He prefers being indoors. He's more refined. And yet, Rebecca comes up with this plot. We're going to fool your father. Now, Isaac can't see. We're going to see that he seems to know something's going on. But I repeat, none of this had to happen. As Christians, we need to be more concerned with the reality than the appearance of things. We need to be sure that our hearts are really for God, that we're really dealing with people with integrity, that our witnesses are never compromised. If we'll do that, then we don't have to worry about what people think. We don't have to worry about the appearance of things. All we can do is say, okay, I'm doing what God wants me to do, and the rest is on you, and God will always be able to take care of you at that time. So his mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Now I want you to highlight that because it doesn't matter if it's your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your grandmother. None of that matters. If somebody tells you to do something that conflicts with the word of God and this whole chapter does, your answer has to be no. Don't get dragged in. Don't get seduced into somebody else's sinful plots. Because the consequences that we'll see tonight are going to fall upon everyone in this chapter. And again, at the risk of being redundant, I'm going to keep saying this tonight, none of this had to happen. Do what I say, go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother. Now these are the goats. Remember that Isaac wanted venison, some game that he likes. Esau fix it just the way that I like it. So Rebecca's shortcut is, no, go out and get some goats. I'll put all the sauce on it and it'll taste just like he won't be able to tell the difference. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And I'm thinking the whole time, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. Have you ever been living a lie and you just knew you were going to get busted? Nobody's going to believe this. I can't sell this to anybody, but you keep on doing it. I say to you often that sin is insane. This is a perfect example of it. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skin. Do you want to know how hairy Esau was? If you would skin a goat, and take slices of the goat skin, the goat hair, that's exactly what Esau looked like, what he felt like. So they're going to have this plot to wrap his hands with this goat hair so that he can pass for Esau. Remember something else. God can never bless deceit, especially within a marriage. God can never bless deceit Now, we've got Isaac and Rebecca who seem never to be together. They don't like one another. They don't trust one another. They both got different plans. And neither of their plans has anything to do with the already revealed will of God. Then she handed to her son, Jacob, the tasty food and the bread she'd made. He went to his father and said, My father, and I'm sure he's trying to disguise his voice, My father... Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, now one verse, we're going to talk about four lies. One verse. Now there are other lies throughout the Bible study, 
But in one verse, this is Jacob dragged by his mother into this scheme. Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn, lie number one. I've done as you told me. That's a lie. Please sit up and eat some of my game. It's not game at all. It's a goat. So that you may give me your blessing. Now with all of those lies, how can this possibly work out? I marvel at the arrogance of people who think they can fool God. You know, the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, says that a man plans his steps, but the Lord sort of mocks or laughs behind the scenes. Because God is the one in charge. We've got four people in a family who are trying to pretend like they're in control, and yet the circumstances are almost keystone copish in the sense that nobody is in control here. Everything is falling apart. Isaac asked his son, how did you find it so quickly? My son, the Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Now, this is the worst lie of all. We've got four in verse 19. This one in verse 20 is the worst one because this is now God being dragged into the plot. You want a perfect definition of taking God's name in vain? This is it. And Isaac is simply saying, Look, God granted me success. This is all God. I'm, I'm being humble. Esau wouldn't have been humble. But here's what he's doing. He's dragging God into his sin. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Now, he may be blind, but his senses are kicking in. He knows something's up. Jacob went close to his father, Isaac, who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands, they are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. Still skeptical. Verse 24. <clears throat> are you really my son Esau, he asked? I am, Jacob replied. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him and he ate and he brought some wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, now he's still suspicious, come here, my son, and kiss me. He's going to grab him so he can smell him. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Oh, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. Now, if you want to think about a nightmare blind date, think about Esau. He smells terrible. He's hairy all over. And yet somehow, Isaac is fooled. Isaac is fooled. Jacob's conscience bothering him through the whole thing, at first appearing to be reluctant to even participate, but he's getting just a little bolder and a little bolder because it seems to be working. And even though he's given several chances to stop this foolishness, he doesn't do it. In verses 6, 18, rather, 20, 21, and 24, he has four opportunities to repent to make a stop to all of this. But he refuses to do so and he gets drawn deeper and deeper into the scheme. Now, I want to repeat something that we talked about last week. It's that Isaac, in his carnality, he bears responsibility for Jacob's flesh here. Now, Jacob is responsible. I told you he's 77 years old. So he's responsible, he's accountable to God to do the right thing and to accept the consequences when he doesn't. But right now he's not thinking about consequences, which is so much like we uh, f encounter when we are thinking about sinning. We're tempted to do something, we want to do it, our flesh is fighting, we don't think about, well, this is going to happen if I get caught. We, we just don't think about it. There's something about temptation where we sort of lose our ability to think. But remember, the apple hasn't fallen very far from the tree here. And while Esau may be Isaac's favorite, 
Isaac bears responsibility not only for the sins of his sons, but he also bears responsibility for the failure in leadership in his own home and is accountable to God for Rebecca's sin, for her lies. This is just seemingly the way this house functioned. Again, there's no trust. There's no love. There seems to be very little interaction. It's two against two, and that seems to be the way things were. And Jacob's main problem through it all was that he was concerned about how things appear rather than how things really are. Now, I'm sure Jacob goes through a whole process of rationalizing the sin in the same way that we do. He might have done it this way, might have thought, well, you know, God wants me to have the blessing. We've known that since my birth. Esau sold it to me. We'll talk more about that later. So we say it really is mine. So anything I have to do, including grabbing or dragging God into my lie in verse 20, is okay. And after all, I'm just doing what my mother wants me to do. You see how easily we can rationalize doing what we know is the wrong thing to do. This is a warning to all of us. There is never an excuse for sinning. There's never an excuse for lying. Lying is one of those things that we as Christians really don't think is one of the big sins. Even though Jesus said that the devil is the father of all lies, we think, well, you know, sometimes you have to lie and you don't want to hurt people's feelings. And, and you know, you've got so much at risk, so you, you, sometimes you've got to stretch the truth a little bit. You never, ever do. And when you do, there will be a price to pay. Because God loves you, because you're a Christian and you profess your love for him, he's going to make sure you don't get away with the lie. Now, he's going to nudge you gently the first few times. But if you persist in a pattern of lying, what's going to happen to you is simple. Your lie is going to be made public, and then there's going to be real consequences to pay. Verse 28 and 29 is the blessing. Listen to this. May God give you of heaven's dew and of earth's richness an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. That's directed toward Esau. Remember, he thinks this is Esau. So he's trying to steal the blessing that God already said belongs to Jacob and give it to Esau. That's how twisted this whole thing is. And then he says, may those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. Now in this blessing, we've got Isaac now taking God's name in vain. Again, dragging God in. He's trying to, 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 to pull the wool over God's eyes, thinking, okay, well, we can work this out. Esau will get the blessing because he's my favorite after all. Now remember, Isaac thinks he's going to die soon. This is sort of a last meal type of thing, at least from his perspective. I want you also to remember that we told you last week that he's going to live another 43 years from this point. He's 137 years old. He's feeling his mortality. I point that out because all he wants is to satisfy his appetite. And by the way, remember, that's what got Esau in trouble in the first place. All he wants is to satisfy his appetite. But see, his senses are failing him. Sight gone. Smell and touch. He's been deceived, so he gives his blessing. Now, the blessing on the firstborn was important because it was a double portion. That's the idea of the blessing. Uh, th there was money, you remember the prodigal son parable. Give me my inheritance. The other sons would get their inheritance, but the oldest son always got double. And when the father gives a blessing, it can't be taken back. It is an unwritten rule at this point. Later, by the way, it will become a written law. So if you say it, it's done, and it can't be undone, and we're going to find out how that affects Isaac in just a few moments. But now he's taking God's name in vain as well. He's declaring that he's speaking for God. He thinks he's speaking to Esau. We know he's speaking to Jacob. 
After Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarily left his father's presence, his brother Esau, uh uh-oh, came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food. Remember, this is real venison here. And brought it to his father. Now, I told you his appetite was all he was concerned about. He settled for goat instead of venison. And now he's too full to eat what he really wanted all along. That's how our flesh tricks us. And while it's a really small thing to consider, your flesh is never, ever satisfied. And you're always going to be inhibited from giving in to your flesh. Then he said to him, My father, sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? Now imagine what's going through Isaac's mind. Well, I'm your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. I like this in verse 33. Isaac trembled violently. Literally, this means he shook greatly with extraordinary fear. And the reason he is now so terrified of God, this is a, a, I call it a holy dread of God. And the reason he's shaken is because he now realizes that he's been caught by God. I tried to manipulate God. I thought it worked out the way I wanted it to work out. And now I find out that it wasn't Esau at all. And now I have to deal with God. Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and I blessed him. And indeed, or in fact, he will be blessed. Now, I believe, and I have no way to prove this, but I believe that this is the place where Isaac stopped fighting God. Again, he's going to live another 43 years. All of this it didn't have to happen. It's all amounted to nothing more than trouble. But I think at this point, he was so afraid of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's what Solomon writes. Right now, he was so afraid of God that he would live his life, the rest of it, relatively quietly. We're not going to hear anything more about him. And I think it's because of this moment. Now, let me talk about the fear of God for a moment. One of the things that you can pray, incidentally, for uh, our nation's leaders um, is it that this holy fear of God would fall upon them. And when I pray, again, I use the, the term this, this holy dread of God. I want our nation's leaders, all of them, doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on, I want them all to wake up in the morning and be terrified of God. I want the fear of God to motivate them to do what they're supposed to do. I want them to get saved for sure. But even more important than that is all of the people that their decisions affect. And you know our government operates without regard at all for the people they're supposed to be representing. And so an effective way for us to pray as Christians is that this holy fear of God would grab their hearts and they'd start doing what God established governments to do in the first place, and that is to to be just and to take care of people and to provide for them and give them direction. We all need that fear of God. And we need it when we're contemplating sin, when we're thinking about lying, we think God's not watching, we're doing something. Husbands, wives, when you're thinking about lying, might be just a little lie from your spouse. You need a holy fear of God to fall upon you. How can your marriage be blessed? if your marriage is grounded in distrust or dishonesty, the secrets that you keep from one another, it's one of those places where you need to pray for that holy fear of God. We just lost that idea completely. One of the things that's happened in the culture that we live in at the time that we live in is we have so emphasized grace and rightly so that we've forgotten that our God is a consuming fire. And we sing love songs to him and we talk about Jesus, my friend, my pal, my buddy. But we need to remember that Jesus is also 
the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords of Revelation chapter 19, whose robe is dipped in the blood of his enemies. We need to realize that he lives, God does, in unapproachable light, and even approaching that light without what Jesus has done for us would, would instantly send us to death. We need to have a holy fear of God. I think about Saul of Tarsus, who, as you know, is the Apostle Paul. When Jesus apprehended him on the road to Damascus, in Acts chapter 9, he saw the light. Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And that holy fear of God would have gripped his heart. Blinded by the light, he had to be led into Damascus where he was put in a room for three days he couldn't see. Can you imagine what those three days were like for him? The shaking, the shivering of fear. Now, I love Jesus with all my heart. I tell you things all the time. Just be with Jesus. Hang out with Jesus. I want that to be true. But the fear of God has to be in our hearts at least to the degree that when we're contemplating sin, when we're contemplating even something as, as inane as a lie, you think, oh, it's not that big a deal. It's just a lie. We need to have and harbor that fear of God always. Had Isaac demonstrated this fear of God at the beginning, there would be no chapter 27 in this book. Fear of God is healthy. And you need to always remember who Jesus really is. He's not just the Lamb of God. He is the King of Kings. He tried to circumvent God's will and he got busted. Enter Esau into the story. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, now I'm going to do this the way I think he did it. Bless me. Me too, father. But he, Isaac said, your brother came, no, I'm sorry, this is uh, still Esau, but he said, your brother came Oh, Isaac, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? That means heel catcher or con man. We talked about that before. He has deceived me these two times. Now, this is where Esau is lying. He took my birthright. He didn't take his birthright. We remember what happened. He sold it for his appetite, like father, like son. What good is my birthright now? I'm hungry. Give me that stew. Well, some of your birthright and I'll give it to you. I'll take it. I'll give it to you. And yet now he's deceiving himself, deceiving his father. Now, I'm not justifying anything that Jacob has done. But Esau is now added to the list of people that can't tell the truth. He took my birthright and now he's taking my blessing but remember, it's not his blessing. He also would have known. He's 77 years old. He also would have known that the older will serve the younger. That would have been part of this family's heritage from the very beginning. How when you know something, you heard it from God yourself. How is it that for 77 years, these boys are raised by these parents and there's no mention of the blessing? How in the world can they not sit down and settle these things so that the family together can follow God? He took my birthright. Now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Hebrews 12 verse 17 says, Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. Now, those are tears of remorse and regret, not tears of repentance. 
Where was his concern for his birthright before he gave it away for a bowl of stew? Could it be that really the only thing Esau is interested in, not the lineage through whom the Christ will come, but the double portion? This is a fleshy guy. This is a, a man who's never been part of a family that served God together. But now, thinking his father's going to die, he wants that double portion of the blessing. Isaac's answer wouldn't have helped. Verse 37, I've made him Lord over you and have made all his relatives his servants and I've sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? I'm thinking right now, Esau is thinking something, anything. But he says, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. His father Isaac answered him, your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. In other words, this is done. There's nothing I can do to change it. Now he's still shaking in fear, Isaac is. And then he throws in this word that turns out to be a word of prophecy. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. That's going to happen between the two brothers as they sort of reconcile a little bit after chapter 32. But remember, this also deals with the people that descended from Esau, the Edomites, who are enemies of Israel. And they're going to finally, in the future, they will be free from Jewish oppression. This entire family treated God's blessing like it was some sort of magic formula, like it was a lucky rabbit's foot, playing fast and loose. I'm hungry, I'll just sell you the blessing. And, and Esau thought there would be no consequences. Isaac, by playing favorites and wanting only what his appetite wanted, well, there was absolutely nothing that he could do now that he's been busted by God and this holy fear of God has fallen on him. And Jacob, of course, we're still not done with him. Jacob is caught in the middle of all of this and the beneficiary of a plot that is full of deceit. It amazes me how Esau conveniently forgot in all of this crying, and all of this pleading, he even forgot he sold his blessing. It didn't mean anything to him. You know, as Christians, we need to think about what we really want in our walk with God and go after it. Now, the way we go after it, of course, is to be with Jesus, to walk with him, to follow him, to obey him, to love him, to be more like him, like him every single day. That's the process called sanctification in the New Testament. But see, there was no thought of God before. I'm betting Esau could have beaten Jacob up and taken the stew. Instead, let's just do it the easy way. Yeah, I'll say my birthright. What good is my birthright? I'm starving here. Without giving it a thought, he's pleading, he's begging. And there's nothing that can be done to change things. Esau was angry. He felt cheated. And in part he was, but he is also cheating. And he was angry that things didn't work out. He and his father had a plan. The plan didn't work out. Now Esau is going to think, for the next 43 years, what about me? Why did I get left out? Not once do we read of any one of this family accepting responsibility for their actions. Not once is there even a moment of regret until God scares Isaac to the point 
where he is shaking. And everybody is pretty much blaming everybody else for the problems they're in. Now, we've got to take personal responsibility for the things that happen in our lives. Until you learn that lesson, then you're going to keep finding yourself in trouble. Instead of following God, doing things your way, you're going to find yourself always sort of running uphill. And God's going to get your attention. He's going to do anything and everything. And finally, you're going to have to pay the price. Reap what you sow. So the time to learn the lesson is now. The problems that you have in your life aren't your parents' fault. The choices that you make in your life, the choices to sin, are not because your husband or your wife doesn't understand you. Not because you've been given bad breaks. It's not because of COVID. It's not because your candidate won or didn't win the election. You are responsible for the choices you make to sin. When you get angry and blow off some steam, that's on you. When you use foul language, that's on you. When you cut corners and cheat, that's on you. When, like this whole family, you want what God wants, but you don't want to do it His way, that's on you. Until we learn to accept responsibility for that, then nothing in our lives are going to change. Why do they have to wait, these two brothers? 43 years to sort of reconcile. And I'll just give you a quick glimpse of coming attractions. The only way reconciliation is possible is that Jacob is going to have to wrestle with Jesus in what is, for me, the most personal chapter in our Bibles. My life chapter. Why not avoid the wrestling match or walking with a limp? Why not get right with God and stay right with God right now, tonight? Please let go of the past. Please let go of the excuses. It's not his fault. It's not her fault. It's not their fault. It's not the bad job. It's you and Jesus. And he'll just open his arms and say, come to me. Let's fix this. Let's fix this. And if you let him, then you will save yourself a lot of pain, a lot of trouble, and you'll start walking in the place of blessing almost immediately. Not so with Esau. He wanted revenge. He wanted blood. Look at verse 41. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Again, sin being insane. He's not thinking about his father going to live another 43 years. What this means is he's going to stay for 43 years with all of this pent up, bottled up anger, rage within him. And he's going to just throw away God. He's going to do what he wants to do for 43 years. Instead of letting all of that happen right now. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Now, beginning next week, our focus is going to turn exclusively to Jacob. Uh, the next eight chapters are about him, and I've already told you this, but it's important as you read ahead. Jacob is the, the one Old Testament saint that every one of us can easily relate to. We're all wheeler dealers. We're all making deals with God. I will do this if you do this, Lord. Well, that's Jacob. We all think we're smart. We think we got ways to get around God. We're always looking for loopholes. Jacob's life is so important for us to learn from. Like many of us, Jacob will meet the Lord. After the first time, he's going to make him some promises that he won't keep. 
And then he's going to continue trying to make deals with the Lord. We can learn to avoid all of that trouble if we'll do it. Let's clean up some unfinished family business. Verse 42. When Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said. Now think about that for a moment. What does that mean? She still has spies. You tell me everything Esau says. You tell me everything my husband Isaac says. She's not learning anything. I told you Joan Collins could learn from her. Well, this is exactly what she's doing. She's stirring the whole thing. There is nothing redeeming about Rebecca's character. She sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, your brother Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you. Now remember, he's a tough guy, an outdoors guy. He can go hunt game and bring him back while Isaac is going out getting his pet goats. Now Isaac... I'm sorry, while well, Esau's out getting his pet goats. And right now, Jacob is going to be terrified from this moment forward for the next 43 years. Now then, my son, do what I say. Second time that Rebecca has told Jacob to do what she tells him to do. Do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. Now, he's going to be with Laban for 20 years. I told you this last week, but bears repeating, Rebecca, in all of her scheming, this is going to be the last time she ever sees the son she loves, Jacob. She's going to be stuck with Esau and his pagan wives. And life is just going to be miserable, all the while pining over the son that she loves. This kind of behavior, this kind of character, always results in consequences that are unforeseen. Now for me, Rebecca's lack of faith here is astounding. Remember, this is Abraham's son and daughter-in-law. The father of our faith the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the God of our Bibles. And she evidently hasn't learned anything. That's why she has some serious control issues. She won't give up control to God. I don't like cliches, but I think at one time or another we've all heard somebody say, well, you know, just let go and let God. It's really good counsel. This is a woman who had serious control issues. Manipulating her husband. Ladies, you can't change your husband through manipulation. You do what you're supposed to do. You walk with Jesus. You walk with uprightness and integrity. And then God will deal with your husband. But you got to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. Otherwise, God's going to be dealing with you. And that's what's happening here. I know it's easy for us to see her sin, but the truth of us, the truth is that many of us do the same kind of things in terms of manipulation. We know what God wants. We know what God's calling is. We got a New Testament full of statements that it is God's will that we don't do those things. Ladies, you know God wants you to submit to the leadership of your husband. And sometimes you're just smart enough to try to manipulate it and make him think he's in charge. And you wonder why God's not blessing your family. It's really important to be honest with God, to be straight with God, deal with him openly because he knows everything anyway. If she would do this now, she wouldn't have to say goodbye to her son. And Jacob, of course, is going to meet more than his match in Laban. And for 20 years, Laban is going to make Jacob's life miserable. So not only has Rebekah destroyed her life, sending away the son she loves she'll never see again. She'll never see any grandchildren. 
But through her deceit and Jacob's compliance, she's really going to destroy his life for at least the next 20 years of it as well. A lesson for all of us. We reap what we sow. We can never outsmart God. She thinks she's got all figured out when your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him. All sin word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? Not only is she lacking faith, but I think personally her real motive is revealed here. Her motive is she wants what makes her feel good. Okay, I can lose Esau, but, but I can't lose you. Remember, Isaac wanted only that which satisfied his appetite. And now she wants the son and is losing the son who gives her life purpose and meaning. I mean, this is like a light going out when Jacob goes and there's nothing that she can do about it. What God wants for each of us is so wonderful, so beyond our ability to even comprehend that we need to stop playing games with God and we need to do it tonight. We need to do it tonight. Then Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. She changes the subject. There's no bearing responsibility at all. She's going right back to the Hittite women that Esau married. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land from Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. Now, all of this, and I'm going to close quickly here with four things that we need to understand are always going to result from our disobedience to God. When when there's little lies that we tell, um, just giving Satan opportunities, these four things. Now, one of the things that you'll note so far in our study through Genesis, is that it seems like brothers have a really hard time getting along. First it was Cain and Abel, now it's Esau and Jacob. In our final character study in the book of Genesis, it'll be Joseph and all of his brothers. They all hate him to the point of wanting to kill him at first and then to say, no, no, we'll just sell him into slavery. And all of it because these families are dysfunctional. Because the brothers, the parents, have forgotten all about God and their obligations to him. Every one of the brothers that we see in Genesis that are causing the problems are rebelling against the will of God and they make those who are in the will of God their enemy. They don't love one another. They're not honest with one another. And they're holding on to unforgiveness which will destroy. Here are the four things that unforgiveness does. Unforgiveness blinds us to the facts of our lives. We start to believe our rationalizations. We start to believe our manipulation. We start to believe the enemy when he says, oh, he did that or she did that to you. You know, you you better protect yourself. Unforgiveness blinds us to the facts. Jacob didn't make Esau sell his birthright. Esau just did it. What a great time for Esau to say to his father and to his brother, I'm sorry. I didn't value the birthright. You had every right to take it. Maybe he would have been dealt with in mercy. But you see, holding on to unforgiveness, anger, rage, blinds us to facts. The second thing unforgiveness does is it causes us to pursue futility. What did she tell Jacob? You can come back when your brothers cool down. Well, we know that's never going to happen. Psalm 37, verse 12, The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 7, 9, Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. 
So we can't hold on to unforgiveness. We can't hold on to anger and to rage. It will destroy us. Third, unforgiveness distorts reality. In this particular case, Esau is the one who is the most culpable. He refuses to accept the reality that it's his fault for selling his birthright. But he also refuses, and all of them are dragged into this, they refuse to accept the reality that God is the owner of the birthright and God has already given that birthright to Jacob. Vengeance never comforts. And for 43 years, Esau is going to get angrier and angrier and angrier. And finally, unforgiveness, lies, anger, all of these things allow Satan to deceive you. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 says, In your anger do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And here's the key, and do not give the devil a foothold. When we willfully sin, when we hold on to anger, when we choose to lie to get ourselves out of trouble, the enemy is just sort of wringing his hands and licking his chops. I got him right where I want him. And I don't know about you, I don't want the devil to have any footholds in my life. Keep your lives upright. Walk in integrity before the Lord. Don't think for a moment that you can manipulate him the way you might be able to manipulate other people. This is a chapter so sad, so ugly, that there's almost no redeeming value at all. I think the thing that we can look forward to is the way God is going to deal with Jacob and how merciful he's going to be, but make no mistake, God is going to deal with Jacob. And then Jacob will be who God wants him to be. But here's the question for us. Why does it have to take so long? Why does it have to take 43 years? Why can't it be today? Why can't we just say, Jesus, you know every lie I tell you, you know every exaggeration. You know everything about me. You know what's in my heart. How about we just start telling God the truth about us? How about we start looking at our personal relationships accepting responsibility for our part in destroying that relationship and no longer pointing fingers at other people. I think we can all be saved a lot of pain and a lot of time. You're listening to a man who waited for 40 years to give his life to Jesus. I don't have any time to waste and because Jesus is coming soon, the days are short, neither do you. If we learn nothing else from this Bible study, let's learn that we can save a lot of time and a lot of pain. I'll close with this. Rocky Three. Clubber Lang was asked by a reporter, if you had any prediction for the fight, and in only the way Mr. T can do it. He said, pain. If you don't deal with God with the right heart, if you don't deal with him honestly, then that same prediction applies to you. And I love you too much. I don't want to see you in pain. Make sure all of the sources of pain in your life come from outside. Nothing self-inflicted. I don't want there to be a Genesis 27 in any of your lives. I hope that makes sense to you. Sorry about this Bible study tonight. Next week, 
read ahead, we start dealing with Jacob. Let's pray. 